where the bread will be, amen, and it will be sufficient to feed, amen. It would be the working of the fish and the bread, the fish, Jesus Christ, and the bread sent down from heaven, amen. The fish, rather, the disciples, and the bread sent down from heaven. But the one thing you want to take note of is it wasn't just any fish. It was dead fish. You cannot give people live fish. I know in some countries they do some crazy stuff, amen? But back in those days, believe me, they weren't, fl- they weren't feeding people fish that were flopping all over the table, amen? amen. They had to be dead fish. And we're going to see how those fish end up dying. But the second thing you need to know is that it would be the working of the fish and the bread together. He broke it, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it away. When the bread would be broken and the fish would be there, that would be enough to feed a lost humanity. A hungry humanity. Now, well, Pastor, you're just probably saying that because, you know, you're trying to extend this and go deep with the fish and the bread. Man, he did it again when he fed 4,000. But just so that you don't think I'm making this up, let's go to John chapter 21. This is after Jesus had resurrected. After Jesus resurrects, he appears to his disciples for 40 days. Now, do you think that Jesus, man, this Jesus is on a mission, amen? From when he came on earth, he's on a mission. Can you imagine his last few days being here with his disciples? He's taking advantage of every opportunity, every moment. He's taking advantage of it to make sure that he conveys his final words to them before he leaves. Amen? He, didn't, he ain't just hanging out with them and, oh, look, y'all, I'm just, you know. No, he's not. I got to give you a message because when I leave, you are going to be responsible to go feed the fish or to go feed the sheep. Amen? You're about to grow this kingdom like fish. Amen? Well, look at what he does on one of these opportunities after he had resurrected. John chapter 21. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter... Thomas, called Didymus, Nathaniel from Canaan in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and the two other disciples were together. I'm going out fishing, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night, they caught absolutely nothing. Now, these guys are bummed out. Their savior is gone. Their their master is dead. You know, the professional fisherman, Peter, who had left fishing to go and hang out with Jesus to be taught how to fish for men, amen? He's bummed out and says, I'm going back fishing. And all his, and all his, all his, his little posse with him and said, you know what, we're going to go with you, amen? Not all of those guys were fishermen, but you know what, what, let's go fish, amen? Now, remind you, mind you, Peter was a professional fisherman. Tra- his trade was fishing. So when he went out fishing that night, Do you think that this was an amateur who did not know how to catch fish? That means that he fished the best way possible. He fished the best way he could that night. Amen? But yet he caught absolutely nothing. Let's go see why he didn't catch absolutely anything. It says here then, it says, Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. Oh, thank you, brother. I appreciate it. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? Jesus focusing on the fish. Y'all, y'all didn't catch nothing? <laughs> no, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed on boat, towing the net full of fish, 
for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. Then they landed. They saw fire of burning coals. There was fish on it and some. You know why they hadn't caught fish all night long? Because all night long the fish were working without the bread. Amen. And when the fish were working without the bread they caught absolutely nothing but in the morning when the bread said cast your net on the right side the fish and the bread were working together and they caught so many fish that they thought that their nets were going to break Amen. It is possible for the church to get to a place where we leave Jesus out of our mission trips, where we leave Jesus out of our evangelism, where we leave Jesus out of our of our strategies. Amen. To grow a church. But God isn't imp impressed with church growth. He wants to grow the kingdom. And kingdom people cannot leave the bread out of the strategy. It is the bread that tells me what to do. It is the bread that leads me. It is the bread that guides me. It is the bread that directs me. Amen. And the bread said, cast it to the right side. And when they cast it to the right side, suddenly the fish caught more fish. Amen. Because this thing was meant to work with fish and bread together. Oh, but so that they could see. They get to the shore, and there Jesus is. He got a fish on the coals. And right along with the fish, he had some what? To so remind them, look, before I go, don't forget what I told you about the fish and the bread. Amen? But then he teaches them a last lesson, a final lesson, two lessons, rather. He said, bring, let's go see what Jesus said. Verse 10, Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have caught. When they went to go get the fish, who were they taking the fish to? To Jesus. Amen? What happens though is sometimes we go out and we catch people. Amen? But we want them because we want them to feel our empty seats or we want them to feel our little positions we got at the church or we want them to feel this. I feel that. Amen. And Jesus said, if you're going to catch the fish, the goal has to be to bring it to the bread. Amen. The goal has to be to bring it to the master. Why? He said, bring me some of the fish. Now, Jesus is there cooking a fish on the coal. What do you suppose he was about to do with the fish? Let's play multiple choice. A, play with the fish. B, throw the fish back into the water. Or C, cut it, clean it, and put it on the coal. I'm going to go with C. Amen. I'm going to go with C, that he was going to cut it, clean it, and put it on the coal. This is the fourth lesson. This is why you bring me the fish. What, why, was Jesus, why did Jesus have the fish on the coal? Well, to understand that, you got to go to Isaiah. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 6. I know y'all deep and y'all know your words, so I might not even have to go there. But Isaiah chapter 6, I just want us to read it out loud. Amen. Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their face. With two wings they covered their feet. And with two they did fly. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Jesus. At the second sound of the voice, at the, rather, at the sound of the voice, the doorpost and threshold shook. And the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I'm ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. What kind of man was he? Unclean. I'm a sinful man. I have unclean lips. And look what he says here. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal. What did he do? He flew to him, and what did he do? He had a live coal, and it says, which he put, or which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Sins are atoned for. Then I 
voice of the Lord saying, who shall I send? Who shall go for us? And I said, here I am. Use me, Lord. What was Jesus showing the disciples on that day, on that early morning when he saw them? He said, if you bring me the fish, I will put them on the coal that will sanctify them. I will sanctify them. I will prepare them. I will clean them. I will equip them to make them useful. So when I say, who will go for me? The fish that I have cleaned with the coal. Amen. I will prepare them. I'm going to prepare them for ministry. I'm going to prepare them to grow the kingdom. I'm going to prepare them to advance them. It will be my sanctifying work that will do it. Amen. So he put the fish on the coal. Because he was sanctifying the fish that were caught by the other fish and brought to him. He had it on the shore. Symbolically using it to show them I will sanctify them. Because again, the high priest rebuilds the sheep gate. The brethren rebuild the fish gate. That's why he asked, who will go for us? We can't go. We're going to rebuild the sheep gate. But who's going to go rebuild the fish gate for us? Those dead fish. Hey Amen. Those dead fish. I'll kill them. And when the 5,000 gather, the fish and the bread will be enough to feed the 5,000. Hey Amen. When Jesus calls his disciples in Luke, Peter, again, in the beginning, had been fishing all night. <laughs> and he told them, go catch some fish. Oh, Jesus, we've been, we know, we, look, we've already been, you know, this is when they first met. Look, we've already been fishing. I'm a master fisherman. I, I do this by trade. Jesus, you preach, I'll fish. Amen? <laughs> Jesus tells him, what, what was Jesus doing? He had gone. He was painting a picture to them how they were going to be fishers of men. He went. He sat in the boat. And he was teaching the people on shore. Amen. He was showing the disciples. He used Peter's boat to show them this is how you're going to fish men going forward. You're going to sit there and you're going to teach them the word. You're going to preach the word of the kingdom. Amen. And then he says to him, now go catch some fish. You think Jesus was interested in some fish? Man, he wasn't interested in fish. He was trying to teach them a lesson using what they already knew. Well, Jesus, we already know. He said, go deeper. They went deeper. And there they found them some fish. Man, what is God saying? What happens right now with the body of Christ is we have preached the gospel to the point we think that we have run out of messages about the gospel so we have turned to other things that are more entertaining. Amen? We, we don't think that, you know, preaching the gospel are going to bring people in anymore. We got to use different strategies now. We teach people about sowing and reaping and doing all this kind of different stuff. And to some extent, that's true. But Jesus said, the way you're going to catch fish, baby, the deep word in the Greek is profundity. I want you to go in the deep things of what I'm preaching, of what I'm teaching. And when you go into the deep of this word, into the depth of this word, there will be enough revelation, amen, for you to catch fish for the kingdom. Stop trying to be on shallow water and catch fish. Go deeper. Amen. The gospel message does not run out of depth, baby. It's so wide and so high and so deep if you understood it. Ain't that the love of God? He said if you understood the love of God, how wide and how deep and how long, baby, you can't measure it. Stop being lazy. Go deeper. You don't have to tr come up with a new trick or a different message or try to pull things out of the word and misconstrue it and twist it to make it sound entertaining or, or interesting. No, go deeper, amen? There's enough depth in this gospel that will save a lost humanity. Amen? The problem with the fish gate, though, is that it was a marketplace. It was where... Money was being exchanged. Let's go read Nehemiah chapter 3 again because it gives us another interesting point. Hallelujah. 
I'm going to go as far as I can, and then I'm going to stop. Amen. I don't want, want y'all to say I'm not coming back tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll be here at 10 a.m. Praise God, 10 a.m., not 12 a.m. or 12 p.m., not 11.30 a.m., 10 a.m. What time? A.m. Amen. That's when the sun is up and out. Amen. Praise the Lord. Notice what it says here. The fish gate was rebuilt by the sons of Hasena. And just to save us some time, Hasena means thorns. Amen? Thorns. Thorns. The first time we see thorns in the scripture was the result of a curse because sin had entered in. How many of y'all were born in sin? And Christ came and found you and called you and caught you and cut you up and killed you and threw you on the coal and used you for his glory. How can God use something that was born out of a curse? Oh, man. So anyway, well, Mermoth, son of Uriah, son of Hakaz, repaired the next section. Next to him, Ashulam, son of Berechiah, the son of Meshezebel, made repairs. And next to him, son of Zadok, son of Benah, also made repairs. Verse 5, next, the next section was repaired by the men of Tekoa. But notice this, this is the only place in all the building plan and the entire reconstructing uh, 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 and the entire project where it says here, but their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under the supervisor. That at the fish gate, there was a group of people who thought they were just too anointed to put their hands to work at the fish gate. Amen? Amen. They, they were too dignified. They were too sanctified. Oh, I don't get my hands dirty with that. Sheep beget sheep. I'm not a sheep. I'm a pastor. I don't get involved with all of that. I'm the, I'm the prophet. I'm this, I'm that. No, baby, it is all of our job to go and fish, baby. Roll up your sleeves and let's go fishing. Yeah, the pastor you, the deacon you, the anointed you, the dignified you, all of you, let's go catch some fish. The problem with this, though, is that at the fish gate, there was money being exchanged. And wherever you find money, you will sooner or later find some corruption. I know, me and Miss Barbara know, amen, we work at the bank, amen? We work at the bank. Every once in a while, we got to fire one joker, amen, who decides that, you know what, I need me about a $50 bill, amen? And so when you go to the gate of evangelism, when you go to the fish gate, because it's a gate of transaction, this is where we find the most corruption. You think that men come with good intentions to go catch fish, but the nobles come there to get some money. Amen? And when we get to the dung gate, you're going to find out why they go back to the fish gate to go get some money. Amen? Amen? But this is the beautiful thing about it. Is that God uses people like you and me right. to make, let's go to Revelation. And then we're going to transition to the old gate. This blessing anybody? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. You have a say, amen? amen? And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals, therefore, for thou wast slain and has redeemed unto us to God by the blood out of every kind and tongue and people and nation. You, Jesus, are worthy to open the seven seals for you have redeemed man back to God. Do you know what redeem means? Let's go. Redeem means in the Greek is the word agorazo, to go to the market, amen, to purchase, especially to redeem. And while you thought you were making the purchase, amen, it was the blood of Jesus that he sent you down there. You normally go to the store 
with a debit card or some cash, amen, or a credit card. But when you go down to the marketplace, you're running with the blood that you got from the sheep gate. And there you're making purchases back for God at the marketplace, amen. This is the gate of purchase. This is where God sends you to go buy men back for him. Amen. Say, I'm making purchases with the blood of the lamb. The fish and the bread working together. When the bread was broken, the fish could go make a purchase. We know what the blood represented he said my the broken bread represents my body which was broken for you amen it was not just broken bread it was my broken body when I break and I bleed disciples know that this is your opportunity to go make purchases for me amen but but the fish gate is the place of evangelism the fish gate where people are being purchased back to God there are a lot of people at the fish gate there's a lot of fish hanging around, a school of fish, amen? But there are some few fish that decide, God, I want to know you deeper. I want to know you more. I want to know not only you more, I want to know your old ways, God, that have never changed. I want to know the old ways of the Lord, amen? And this is where you begin to head down to the old gate. Let's go see what happens at the old gate, Nehemiah chapter 3. And it says in verse 6, now if you're reading a a certain version, it says the uh, Jeshana gate. If you're reading another version, it says the old gate. And the reason you find that is because Jeshana in Hebrew means old. Amen. The old gate was repaired by Yoyaida, son of Paseah, and Meshulam, son of Besodiah. Who repaired it? Yoyaida and Meshulam. Yoyaida and Meshulam. These two guys God used to repair the old gate. Let's read. Let me read what Jeremiah 6 verse 16 says. Thus says the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. Say the old ways. The old ways of the Lord never change. He doesn't change. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. I am God. I'm this Lord. I'm the same. I change not. Amen? I'm the same. Whenever you see me, wherever I'm at, I am the same God. I'm consistent. I'm integral. I'm holy. Amen? I want you to understand, though, that the old gate is probably the most controversial gates of all the gates. Because theologians debate as to why it was called the old gate. Some say it was called the old gate because it was the old gate to the city or the the city. It was the gate to the old city. Some think it was the old gate because it was the oldest gate of them all. And then the other debate that they have is the exact location of the gate. Some think it's further east. Some think it's further west. Some think it's further south. Some think it's further north. The beautiful thing about the old gate was that Yoyaida rebuilt the gate. Say, Yoyaida rebuilt the gate. Yoyaida in the Hebrew means the Lord knows. <laughs> Amen. Who? The Lord knows. So while theologians may not know, and while studied, educated, you know, uh, philosophers and all these guys may not know, the Lord knows. Why? Because the old ways of the Lord cannot be taught. You can't study them and discover them. They can only be revealed to you. The old ways can only be what? Revealed. Revealed. We can try to teach them to you all day long, but it is the revelation, the Holy Spirit, that begins to open up your mind and your understanding. Amen? Well, let's go down the old gate together, amen, and see what God was saying for all those fish that want to go deeper. Say, I want to go deeper. Then you want to go down to the old gate. Amen. The old gate of the Lord. Old. The old gate means concealed. The vanishing point. Generally time out of mind. Amen. 
the vanishing point, the concealed place. Why? Because the old ways of the Lord are concealed. You cannot be taught them. He reveals them to you. As you begin to seek them, he reveals them to you. We're going to see how he does it. Amen? Amen. The old ways of the Lord. Let's go over there to, um, well, I want to tell you one other thing. Yoyida, who was the son of Pasea. The son of who? Pasea. All right. Now, when he mentions that, he does it on purpose. Amen? Yoyida means what? The Lord knows. Pasea, his father, means cripple. Now, that when I was studying and I was before the Lord, I'm thinking, okay, Lord, I ran into a wall. Now, what does that mean? Well, how does cripple, how, how, does, how does knowing the Lord, how does the Lord know come from a guy named cripple? Amen? How does knowing the Lord come from a guy named cripple? So I was stuck. And I sat there, and I was like, okay, Lord. I don't know what I'm doing. Genesis. <laughs> Chapter 32. Somebody say the old gate. The old gate. Mm. Genesis chapter 32. And it says here in verse 22. Y'all have it say amen. amen. I'm going to wait on a few more. Genesis. Genesis chapter 32, verse 22. That night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maidservants, and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent, them all, he, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. Who? A man wrestled with him till daybreak. Now, when I went to see the Hebrew word for wrestled, I thought that I was going to find the word fight. But the word I found was be dust. Now, I'm not an English major, amen? So I didn't really know what be dust meant. So I went over there to Webster and asked Webster, hey, what does be dust mean? Be dust means, really simple, to cover with dust. I was like, okay. So what the angel was doing or what the man was doing with Jacob was that they were covering each other with dust all night long. Say be dust. Let's see why this is important. And it says there, when the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Yeah. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go until you bless me. Now, I know in revivals we say, you know, we're not going to let God go until he blesses us, bless me with my car and bless me with my shoes and bless me with all these different things. But you got to be logical when you're reading this. They're wrestling, all right? They're wrestling with one another. The Hebrew, when you study it, what he was saying is, I'm not going to let you go. And the men who watch MMA are going to understand this until you tap out. Amen? Until you surrender, until you give up, until you say, I submit. Amen? So when they were wrestling, amen, it's not logical to say, hey, brother, we wrestling. Brother, I'm not going to go until you bless me with some new shoes. <laughs> but it's logical that I would say, brother, if you don't quit, I'm not going to let you go. I dare you, and then I'm going to get you in that guillotine, and then you, hopefully you give up by then. Amen? If not, then you're going to pass out, and we will never know how you really felt about it. <laughs> amen? So they were wrestling all night long, and so it gets to the point where the angel touches his socket of his hip. Now look at what happens here. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me, unless you surrender. The man asked him, what is your name? And Jacob, uh, um, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with man and have overcome 
Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel saying, it is because I saw God face to face and yet my life was spared. He saw God face to face and his life was spared. Now check this out. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel and he was, what did your Bible say? He was what? He was what? As one man, let's say what the Bible said. What did he do? He went away limping <laughs> because the angel had touched him in his socket and dislocated it. He went away a crippled man <laughs> because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of his hip because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near this tendon. Yo, Yaida means the Lord knows. His father, Pasea, means crippled. The way that the Lord knows comes from a man named crippled is when the angel of the Lord was wrestling with this guy all night long and he was covering him with dust all night long. Now check this out. Let me show you what he was doing when he was covering him with dust. Go to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. You have it say amen. amen. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The man became a living being. He was formed by what? Yes. By dust. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 43. We're going to read the word today, amen. amen. I didn't know the Bible had so many books. Chapter 43 of Isaiah, verse 1. God formed man by what? By dust. But now this is what the Lord says. Everybody have it? I'm going to go to the page and stop flipping. I want you to read this revelation together. But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Jacob. He who formed you, O Israel. <laughs> What was he doing? I was covering him with dust all night long because I was making him all over again.